Um, it's been absolutely wonderful coming here and seeing the wonderful exhibition downstairs. So I thought I'd start with an illustrator who isn't in the exhibition, and that's the wonderful Chris Riddle, the Children's yeah. Laureate, who recently, if you don't follow him on Facebook, please do, because he puts original illustrations on Facebook, and he recently stated that his earliest childhood memory of children's literature is being read The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. Now, it's two days ago, I thought that's very timely, um, and his favourite children's book illustrator is William Heath Robinson, well, what a coincidence. <laughs> so um, this is really interesting. Because, I, I mean, I put the other one as well because um, I'm a Lewis Carroll fan and his favourite book is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, so I thought I'd put that on record too. Um, but one of the things that I thought um, Chris Riddle really brings across quite well is that he says, my earliest memory of children's literature is being read The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. But there's something else there as well. He remembers it is the edition with illustrations by Lucy Atwell. So this is really interesting because um, when we think of children's stories, which we read as, um, or we were read to as a child, um, very often they are tied to a very close memory of the illustrations that we first saw. And I'm sure you have an example, all of you, um, that springs to your mind, really, that book is tied to those illustrations. And it can be really magical recalling that um, experience, but it can also be terrifying. H.G. Wells, for instance, writes he only started writing because he always remembered the terror of the illustrations of his childhood edition of The Pilgrim's Progress. And he said they were so vivid he could see hell yearning below. And um, it can really fi fill you with bottomless fear. If I think um, of one of the first uh, stories I was read to as a child, which is the German tale of the Struvelpeter, every single time I remember whether I want, whether I've put the candles out or not, I remember the lines of the story of the girl who played with matches and set herself on fire. And um, it's a long time ago I was first read this book. <laughs> But thinking of the books we read as children and rereading them as adults, this can evoke also quite a different um, sensation. This can be funny, like those. When you think of, well, wow, that was the real reason my daddy gave me that book. Or we can often be made to think quite different things. Like, how did I not pick up on this when I was a child? Or it even gets to another level when you're teaching children's literature like me at university level and you're really trying to get to the bottom of what those stories have to say and your students first start thinking, but why would the author have put this there? I thought this is supposed to be a children's book. And indeed, finally, you might ask yourself, I wonder whether this book was really written with children in mind. And if you were ever read The Water Babies as a child and reread it as an adult, you may even have asked yourself the same question. But what would The Water Babies and its illustrations have meant to contemporary readers? And how does, does this correlate with how we now think of the novel? And what was The Water Babies really intended as a book for children? And so those are some of the questions I, we, I will be looking into today, and I will do that in three parts, um, so just so to give you an overview. I'll first be looking at the illustration uh, and publication history of The Water Babies and who his author was, um, and into what sort of environment the tale was published. And secondly, I will look into Victorian children's literature, and the most prominent themes in the novel being science and evolution. And finally, with that background in mind, I will come to the illustrations by Lindley Sanborn to unveil some of their hidden meanings. And I, I realize I might speak about some things you already know, some you don't, and some you might, might even not believe me. Um, but hopefully the main purpose of my talk is to draw out some not so frequently made connections, and perhaps that'll make you think of the story in a different way. So let's begin. If we want to understand the, what the Victorians would really made of the Water Babies upon its first publication, we need to first of all stop thinking of the Water Babies as a book, because it wasn't. The Water Babies was serialized, like many uh, Victorian books, um, by chapter by chapter, starting in August 1862 in Macmillan's magazine. Macmillan's magazine was founded in 1859 by the same publishers that we still know under the name Macmillan. And this was not a literary journal. This was a Victorian intellectual magazine with a very particular readership in mind. And if you're wondering into what sort of environment the first chapter of The Water Babies would have uh, been released, I've brought you a oops, table of contents. Um, you can see there on the right, this is the front page of the um, first um, 
chapter of, the, of Macmillan's magazine's Water Babies. And you'd be forgiven to think when you read through those titles on the right there that this is not a children's magazine because it wasn't. If you're thinking, um, I might just be showing you the most irrelevant issue or the most boring one. Um, here's the table of contents for the entire thing. And don't worry if you can, can't read this. Um, you'll start getting a, a slightly better idea. If you look uh, where the water babies really fitted into the Victorian intellectual landscape, um, when you start reading through some of those titles, those include Charles Lyell on the Antiquity of Man, An Ideal of Local Government of the Metropolis, meaning London, a gossip about the natural and economic history of oysters. We're getting into Alice in Wonderland territory here. The chemistry of the sea and the political economy of the gospel being a theological evaluation of Victorian economics. There's also a poem called Glaucus by Thomas Hood. And for those of you who know Charles Kingsley well, that was one of his first books, was also called Glaucus, but I'll come back to that. So what we see here is a magazine concerned with social criticism and some articles on natural history. And all of that would have probably been uh, in accordance with the views of the Macmillan brothers, um, as they would have supported a predominantly Christian perspective on the whole matter, and more particularly the, that of Christian socialism. We can, so those, that was a movement linked to workers' rights and work, workers' lives improvement, and um, was very prominent in the Chartist movement. So we can also see the origins of the Macmillan Publishing House here as an academic publisher um, based at Cambridge um, at the university at which Kingsley was a professor, a professor of modern history. And so the main publications of Macmillan would have been academic. And the very first of the fiction they would have published was actually Charles Kingsley's. He was good at marketing. He was like, we need to start publishing fiction. So they started doing that. And so while this perfectly explains the context of Macmillan's magazine, what does this tell us about the water babies? And perhaps in order to understand this, we need to recreate the experience of rereading a children's book as an adult. So let's start having a look on how it all starts. Once upon a time, there was a little chimney sweep, and his name was Tom. That is a short name, and you have heard it before. So we, you will not have much trouble in remembering it. He lived in a great town in the North Country, he could not read or write, nor did he care to do either. He never washed himself, for there never was any water up the court where he lived. He had never been taught to say his prayers. He never had heard of God or Christ, except in words which you have never heard, and which it would have been very well if you'd never heard them. <laughs> he cried half his time. He laughed the other half. He cried when we had to cli climb up dark flues, rubbing his poor knees and elbows raw, when the soot got into his eyes which it did every day of the week, and when his master beat him, which it did every day of the week, and when he had not enough to eat, which happened every day in the week likewise. And he laughed the other half when he was tossing halfpennies with the other boys or playing leapfrog over posts or bowling stones at the horse's legs as they trotted by, which was last excellent fun when there was a wall to hide behind. And yes, there were good times coming. And having reread this first paragraph, I find it surprising that by the end of it, we have quite forgotten that it begins with the classic fairy tale opening once upon a time. And we're left wondering after this harrowing description of Tom's childhood, what good times are possibly meant to be coming for that sort of boy? So let's spend a little bit more time figuring this out. In the very first two sentences states, Tom is a very short name, and we've probably heard it before. This reminds us a little bit of Oliver Twist, um, who was named randomly according to the uh, scheme they had running at the workhouse, which tells us that Tom might perhaps also not be a very well looked after boy. More intriguingly, Kingsley says, you may have heard this name before. And in a work that is heavily laced with quotations from the romantic poets, this reminds us of William Blake's poem, The Chimney Sweeper, from the Songs of Innocence and Experience. Like Blake's chimney sweep, Tom Dacre, his mother, mother is dead and his father is a criminal. The father of Kingsley's Tom, we learn, has been sent to Botany Bay, the penal colony. Both Toms cry a lot. Now, although among the child laborers, the chimney sweepers were statistically a minority, they were a prominent tragic figure, a symbol for lost childhood, a device, almost a narrative device, to expose the grim consequences of mid-Victorian laissez-faire capitalism. 
In socially critical literature, the rhymes sweep and weep are omnipresent, as this poem from the magazine Fun, which is ironic, um, where we find another similar portrayal of a chimney sweeper boys as children who labor before they learned to play. And the third rhyme that almost always goes with weep and sleep is the euphemistic sleep. To a better to sleep in eternal death than life to keep in hopeless, endless dole. Kinder is death than the heart of men. It speeds them home to the longed for rest. Kingsley points the finger here very firmly at those who caused the situation before the novel even starts. The epigraph accuses those playing leapfrog with children's lives and realities. And when we consider that playing leapfrog is one of the very few things that makes Tom laugh, it becomes evident how macabre his situation is. And the rhyme drives home what those good times that are coming for Tom might actually be. And the allusion to Blake's poem would have made this clear already to the contemporary reader. Um, as Blake's Tom has a vision. So this is Blake's poem. And so he was quiet that very night. As Tom was sleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, and Ned, and Jack, were locked up in coffins of black. And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, leaping, laughing, they run, and wash in a river and shine in the sun. And in the first chapter of The Water Babies, this would have set the scene for the fate of the chimney sweeper boy who runs away after he accidentally ends up in little Miss Ellie's room, sweeping the chimneys of a great mansion. He runs towards a river, hallucinating the sounds of ringing bells, and he hears the song of the river he so longs for, which sings a chilling lullaby to Tom's final sleep. Clear and cool, the dreaming pool calls, play by me, bathe in me, mother and child. And knowing Tom's mother is dead, we get the first indication that Tom is indeed to follow her. But not without Kingsley given the reason for the fate in the second stanza of the river song, Dank and foul, dank and foul, by the smoky town in its murky cowl, foul and dank, foul and dank, by wolf and river and slimy bank. Darker and darker the farther I go, baser and baser the richer I grow. Who dares sport with the cinder files? Shrink from me, turn from me, mother and child. And this is the first time in the story the illustration is actually more specific than the text. At the first glance, this is the illustration that goes with the poem, we only see the river fairy, which is quite prominently portrayed on the, the tree, the river in the background, her hair flowing almost into the river, nearly forming a symbiosis. But if we look more closely, the illustration also represents the second stanza. And I've magnified this for you. Aha. On this side, the focus on this bit. Um, if you remember the very first paragraph of the story, we learn Tom doesn't wash because there's no water in his court. And what Sanborn very specifically depicts here is Jacob's Island a district in London's infamous um, district, Bermondsey, which is infamous for its horrendous accommodation of the working classes, which was responsible for several cholera outbreaks in the Victorian age, and another symbol of failure of laissez-faire capitalism. Sanborn adds, adds a sack labelled wealth to make that really clear. And the way in which the Victorians would have heard about this district is from several devastating newspaper articles written at the time um, by one of the most, social most prominent social campaigners of the age, age, and you guessed it, that was Charles Kingsley. And that's really what Kingsley was known for in his age. Kingsley was at that stage not known as a, also as a children's author even. Um, um, he was known as a social campaigner, and he was specifically known for his harrowing imagery. And just so you get an impression, this was, oh, this is, um, this is Jacob's Island. And th this is um, one of Kingsley's sanitary lectures, so you get an idea of his tone in them. And as the last stanza of the song ends, um, ends the first chapter and indicates that the face that expects Tom is indeed that in feverish hallucination he drowns himself in the river. Image, text, literary and social references work really closely to embed this dying 
child in a very specific context. And if you're now thinking, dying mothers, child suicide, cholera, this all doesn't sound like a fairy tale for a land baby, you'd be forgiven because we haven't actually got to the fairy tale bit yet. However, we will see why it's really important to remind ourselves what happened before the fairy tale. Part two. The main reason we think of the water babies as a fairy tale is what happens afterwards. And Tom? Ah, now comes the most wonderful part of this wonderful story. Tom, when he woke, well, of course he woke, Children's always, children always wake after they have had slept, slept exactly as long as is good for them found himself swimming about in a stream, being about four inches, or that I may be accurate, 3.87902 inches long, and having round the paratoid region of his forces a set of external gills, I hope you understand all the big words. In fact, the fairies had turned him into a water baby. Tom has now changed sides, and instead of the social environment that's clearly portrayed as evil, he becomes part of nature that Kingsley shows to be purely good. It's a release of the soul, and as in every good fairy tale, we have a transformation of a human into, well, whatever a water baby is, but we'll come to that. Transformation is the key aspect of the water babies and also ties together the several identities of the tale itself. I pointed out the original publication environment and that critics have emphasized just how important that was. Some really claim that it reads like Macmillan's magazine put in a blender and reassembled. But um, that's not what we now think of when we pick the book off the shelf. Um, and that's because the story, when it was republished as a book, was reframed in quite a different manner. And so the book, in fact, itself underwent a transformation, and in fact, several. Um, we now, oh, here we go. We get a nice fairy tale font telling us it's definitely a fairy tale. And, um, and most of it, it looks old, it must be a fairy tale. And most importantly, that it comes with 100 illustrations by Lindley Sanborn. And the tale is framed with snippets of romantic poetry, which make the whole thing much nicer, and instead of a single epigraph at the end. Um, and even more interestingly, is the dedication to Kingsley's son, Grenville, and all other good boys, followed by the aphorism, come read my riddle, each good little man. If you cannot read it, no grown-up can. This gives us a pretty good indication that this book might in fact be intended for two audiences. Furthermore, it implies that perhaps child audiences may in fact be better at interpreting its message. And finally, this might even imply that the adults reading this tale may have to become to some degree like children and undergo a transformation themselves to understand it. Now, Kingsley is very specific about what the message of his story is in a letter to his friend and role model, Frederick Denison Morris, the leader of the social, um, social uh, movement. Um, he writes in this letter, I have tried in all sorts of queer ways to make children and grown folks understand that there is quite a miraculous and divine element underlying all physical nature and that nobody knows anything about anything in the sense that in which they may know God in Christ um, and right and wrong. And I have wrapped my parable in seeming tomfooleries. It is because so only could I get the pill swallowed by a generation who are not believing with anything like their whole heart in the living God. And Tom undergoes a transformational journey to unlearn what society has told him and instead learn how the world really works, or rather ought to work, from the correct source, and that is nature itself. This is a journey of transformation and education, and what Tom learns is nothing less than the law of God, represented in the workings of his creation, which ought to morally reform him, and vicariously the reader, who is taken on the same journey to learn from nature's law in order to reform his immoral society. So the ingredients we need for that are ideally a child and in all this um, <clears throat> um, and ideally science and nature and somebody who is capable of learning and being modeled and willing to learn. This is why we have a child. And all this lands Kingsley bang in the middle of the very latest best-selling trend in Victorian children's literature. So let me explain what that means without the marketing lingo. 
1862, um, there wasn't really such a thing as children's literature, as we now know it. Here's a contemporary Christmas list of books recommended to parents for children a year before the book comes out. And what we can see is the first translations of fairy tales just starting to come out. And otherwise, we see things that we don't really think of children's literature anymore. Um, maybe Robinson Crusoe and the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, but it's all pretty heavily moralistic stuff. So what did children read until then? And the answer is, perhaps slightly surprisingly, natural history books. These were absolutely beautiful illustrated books, um, which all followed a similar narrative pattern, which you may recognize. A teacher figure, normally an adult, would educate children in a natural setting to explore in dialogues nature and teach the workings of God's creation. And this was perceived morally wholesome because they were learning from God. More importantly, this was to eventually enable children to autonomously read and interpret nature. So it was to make children go on a journey by themselves, and that's important. So where do the fairies come in in this? Well, don't fear. Uh, in order to make abstract scientific concepts visible and graspable to children, Victorian science popularizers very often actually resorted to fairies. So this is like some of the best-selling Victorian children's fiction. Um, the fairy land of science through magic glasses, which is a book about tele telescopy and uh, microscopy. And I mean, if you, if you think about it, when speaking about abstract things like, for instance, the weather or water, processes of erosion and evaporation and underlying processes, um, which are really quite difficult, they were often embodied in fairies, the fairy of weather and the fairy of water, and which familiarized the potentially intimidating and unfathomable scientific process and made them appear ordered and in control because the fairies were themselves handmaidens to God just like in Kingsley's story. So a lot of these natural histories were actually written by pastors. So children's literature, science, and illustration absolutely went hand in hand in the Victorian age. And this is quite strikingly illustrated when we reconsider some famous uh, Victorian children's writers, which would perhaps not have occurred to us in this way before. So let's take, for instance, uh, the nonsense author, um, oh, this is some of Kingsley's stuff, um, Edward Lear. His nonsense botany, for instance, very clearly plays with the discoveries of modern science, such as the Linnaean two-part notation for species names, which we see in um, things like Piggy Wiggia Pyramidalis, Fat Facia Stupenda, which I think is an excellent insult, <coughs> Small Tooth Comia Domestica, or my favorite, Many Peoplia Upsidonia. <laughs> Now, you might think this is a bit of a stretch. I'm really just shoehorning the science into this. But Lear did actually know his science. And part of his day job was, in fact, ta -da, to illustrate natural histories. I'm not joking. This is Edward Lear's drawings. And Edward Lear was actually, he painted these in the Royal Zoological Society. And the anecdote goes that he was locked in a room with these parrots on the left-hand side. And he had four of them. And they said, oh, just paint that species over there. And Mr. Lear turned around and said, which one? And they said, well, the red one. And he said, no, no, there are three different kinds. And he said, really? And his eyesight was apparently so keen and so good that he spotted they were actually different species. And one of these species is actually still named after Edward Lear. So, you know, that was his day job. He was really good at this whole science thing. But that puts his, his portrayal of nature into a rather different light. When we look at the sort of nonsense classification system of, the, of nonsense zoology with its very own bird classification system, or even his famous limericks. Um, there was an old man with a beard who said, it is just as I feared. Two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren have all built their nests in my beard. But this puts, um, and so even in his famous limericks, we have, the, um, we have really schematic drawings but still, we can tell which one is the male bird and which one is the female bird. Okay, I think you've got it. <laughs> so another famous example is, for instance, Alice in Wonderland. Um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, um, in its first incarnation, Alice's Adventures Underground, was actually illustrated. So the birds were illustrated um, from a natural history book. Um, and this is an insider thing, which you can remember for a pub quiz. The first version doesn't have a flamingo. It has an ostrich. 
which was illustrated from a natural history book. That's important. Um, so rethinking um, Alice in this context uh, of natural histories really puts into a different light episodes like, for instance, the Looking Glass Forest, when Alice discovers a host of unknown insects. And the first thing she does is she inquires after their name and then classifies them by habitat, by food, and further conditions of survival. Alice is like a little entomologist, into which the children were turned by reading natural histories, encouraged to do their own research um, out in their backyard or in the forest. And that's not a coincidence. It's because that it, it is the narrative structure, children's tales, uh, what well, children would have been used to at the time. And this becomes, of course, then the narrative structure for authors like Kingsley and Carroll to play with. So while to us nowadays, the symbiosis of science and literature might be a little bit counterintuitive, in the Victorian age, it was really absolutely everywhere because the scientific progress was really so prominent. So it was in children's literature, in popular culture, and there certain narrative tropes solidified, such as, for instance, you always have a ludicrous scientist. He might be a layman or a professor, but what's important is that he uses as many as possible scientific sounding words to sound professionally, but actually is not reliable or trustworthy as a scientist at all. We get that, for instance, in Gilbert and Sullivan's major general, who knows everything that's scientific, but actually hasn't got a clue because the pairings don't make any sense at all. And the same sort of pattern we get also in Kingsley's um, um, Professor Put Them All in Spirits, um, which with the vowels in means put them all in spirits, um, which gives you his approach to science. But he said, Deary me, he cried, what a large pink holothurian. With hands too, it must be a synapta. And he took him out. Oh, actually, it has eyes, he cried. It must be a cephalopod. This is most extraordinary. And so he gives him two long names, which is the Linnaean notation. One, which is a little bit about Tom, but the, the other one, which matters, which is all about himself. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> you get the idea. So when we're talking about science, we must, of course, not forget the most important scientific event of the 19th century, which was the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. The very first thing I always clarify, that it wasn't evolutionary theory that made Darwin so important. Whoops. Yeah, evolution was not new. Kingsley had, in fact, written about it in Glaucus. What did make Darwin important, and for that unsettling, was the idea of evolution by natural selection. Now, the difference was that rather than an upward line with man as the crown of creation and stepping stone to yet greater perfection to come, Darwin imagined evolution like a tree. tree a tree of life, which is the image he used, um, whose branches could at any stage die off species decline or potentially face extinction. And in an economy, as Kingsley describes it at the beginning of the water babies, a society that drives its own offspring to suicide, that does not bode well for survival of a species. So after all that we've heard about how well Kingsley fitted into the certain, uh, a certain intellectual milieu, it is where he, this is where he was remarkable. Despite being a high-ranking member of the clergy, he became canon of Westminster Abbey and therefore the canon to Queen Victoria herself. He was unafraid of such changes and learning from nature was to him absolutely superior to any doctrine. A reputation that was probably the reason that he was one of the few people who was sent an advanced copy of The Origin of Species in 1859. So he replies to Kingsley, uh, Kingsley replies to Darwin, all I have seen of your book awes me, both with a heap of facts and the prestige of your name. Also with the clear intuition that if you are right, I must give up a lot that I have said and written. And in that I care little. Let God be true and every man a liar. The Water Babies, as we said, is a story of transformation. And as a fairy tale usually comes with a moral which teaches us to turn away from an evil fate and towards a better one. Kingsley's fairy tale is one of averting the evil of social society's disintegration and extinction, which was, as we gather from the narrative frame, a very real danger to Kingsley. And the lesson on how to avert that is exactly what Tom learns in his underwater journey. Like all natural histories, he learns from the fairies who run nature as a representation of the natural forces, uh, which are God's law and therefore include evolution 
And when we remind ourselves of the publication date of the origin of species, 1859, and the foundation of Macmillan's magazine, no points for guessing, 1859, this was not a coincidence. But Kingsley was reacting to the debate that Darwin's book had instigated. And so, of course, also Kingsley, Kingsley also reacts to evolution and its threatening aspect. The lessons learned from nature are lessons on how to regain control of mankind's future and the threatening, uncontrollable post-Darwinian discourse. And Kingsley writes a fantastic tale because when we think about the origin of the word fantasy, which is from Greek, to make visible, it is a step-by-step -step illustration of what has gone wrong in society, how we can recognize it, namely by the use of science and learning from nature, and intervene in order to transform society and put its wrongs right. And this is where the final part of my talk comes in, as you'll be glad to hear. And this is where the illustration of Lindley Sanborn come into all of this. Now, Sanborn is the famous first illustrator of Kingsley's Water Babies. He wasn't the first illustrator, but everybody always tells you that. Um, but he was certainly one of the more prominent ones and certainly the one who did most of the first illustrations. However, Sanborn was never originally meant to do the illustrations. And also when it came to it, he was not the first choice. He wasn't even chosen by Kingsley because Kingsley was at that stage dead. And so his widow, Frances Kingsley, took over the first big illustrated edition of The Water Babies. And she originally approached John Tenniel, who had illustrated Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. As the whole family, she writes enthusiastically in lots of letters to Tenniel, um, had enjoyed Alice's Adventures in Wonderland so much, and especially its enchanting publication. So the letters are really, really lovely. I would love to show you them. They're sitting in the British Library, but they wouldn't let me photograph and show, you, show them to you. So you must go and check for yourself. Um, but Tenniel indicates quite interestingly in his replies to Francis Kingsley that Carol was already quite a handful to deal with and he would rather not illustrate any more children's books. So she returns to Noel Patton, who has the, done the big two round ex, um, illustrations that you've seen downstairs or will see downstairs. So finally, Lindley Jam Sanborn was the man approached for the job. And this is very interesting because Sanborn, like Tenniel, was a punch illustrator and was probably known to the Victorian intellectual circles for his caricatures of the Darwin controversy. So you've seen one of those illustrations already, which is um, the famous illustration of Darwin, which is called Man is But a Worm. And so this is his no most well-known caricature. Um, which crucially indicates, um, of course, the progress um, of evolution, so from a worm all the way around into a monkey and eventually into Darwin. But if you're cheeky, you could actually read it the other way around. That man is disintegrating into nothing but a worm. Um, the other thing that um, Sanborn would have been regularly drawing for um, the punch um, was designs after nature. So this will be good for fashion fans um, because this is where um, nature was taken as a model for ladies' fashion but was perhaps crucially taken a little bit too far. Um, if this interests you, I've written an article for the Royal Entomological Society about this. Um, so yeah, to recapture the most important features, readers would have related to Sanborn would have been Darwin, the aspect of transformation and so, sort of symbiotic man-animal portraits. And um, so once we know all of this background, we can really start drawing out an awful lot of the illustrations. So let's have a look at those. And I'm going to start off with Jeffrey's favorite illustrations, he tells me, um, of uh, the water babies, um, which is the story of the do-as-you-likes. So this is, um, Tom goes on this underwater journey, and when he's at the stage, the threshold of the final bit of his story, um, the fairy tells Tom he must go the last part of his journey alone. But before he goes, like every good boy, he's being read a fairy tale, namely a picture book, which the fairy takes out of a crack in a rock at the bottom of the sea. So this is a fossil record that she, of evolution that the fairy reads to Tom. And this is the story of the do-as-you-likes, which were, um, as you can gather from the name again, a sort of critique of capitalism, um, which were people who lived near a um, volcano, 
um, which had very fertile land. So they made a lot of money from farming and everything. They grew quite rich and quite famous. And they decided to um, actually, we're now so famous, we don't have to do anything anymore. We've just become very lazy um, and let other people do the job. So it's a picture of Victorian society. And so because they um, neglect their sort of moral duty to actually learn from nature, um, they become lazier and lazier, and from uh, the man they, men they were once were, start developing into apes. They lose their language, they lose um, their ability to walk, they lose their culture, their everything. And most importantly, they lose their stories. So they don't tell the fairy tale anymore of the erupting volcano, which eventually comes for them and kills them. Um, it's a really cheerful story. Um, <laughs> But um, rather than in installments, because the fairy tale comes in installments in the story, Sanborn portrays them all in one picture, which, as you've seen from my motion, probably reminds you a little bit of his Darwin illustration, just with a major difference that you cannot read this the other way around, as you could with the Darwin illustration, because he declares man to be the alpha and monkey to be the omega. And this is the last illustration we get this is very clearly the way society is currently going. And so why is this important? Because this story was, um, so the illustrated version was published in the 1880s rather than in the 1860s in which um, Darwin's theory was new. But in the 1880s, degeneration theory became a really big thing. If you think of stories that came out in the fin de siècle, you think of stories like um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the picture of Dorian Gray. There's always the dark side of mankind that's sort of waiting to catch up with you. This is the time into which this was published. So this is really quite strong stuff to publish at that time. Um, but the story already contains the idea that evolution can go both ways, which is as old as evolutionary theory itself. Um, and we, we get this weird lizard creature with an almost human face and said, but let's, let's recollect that there are always two sides to every question and a downhill as well as an uphill road. And if I can turn beasts into man, I can, by the same laws of circumstance, selection and competition, turn men into beasts. And this is really interesting because we are talking about this fantastic story which defeats the laws of physics and time and space. And when something happens, we can immediately make it visible, which in evolutionary terms might take quite a long time. So at the very start of his water journey, Tom, who is a slightly naughty boy, steals sweets from the fairy's cupboard. And he is punished because his immorality immediately displays in his degeneration. He starts descending back on the evolutionary scale and starts looking like a sea urchin. Um, but this not only illustrates the belief in degeneration theory, but also the then still common belief in recapitulation theory, um, which is the now debunked theories that creationists like to come back to, that the fetus goes through all stages of animal evolution before it takes human shape. This sounds cool, but it isn't true. Um, which is why children were considered for a long time in Victorian psychiatry to be more beast-like than animal-like. So Kingsley also provides evidence that this is reversible and Tom's development goes the other way round. And here the illustrations are absolutely crucial because Kingsley only describes Tom's moral transformation, but Sanborn shows us how this is reflected physically. So here we see Tom progressing through his story, and you can clearly see him growing up into a healthy young boy. And that is very unlike the shaven head of the chimney sweep. Chimney sweepers always have their hair shaved off. He has a full head of hair. And you can see that even better in some of the other illustrations that show him from the back. And that Tom's reality in his actual life, would he not have died, would have taken quite a different path becomes quite clear against this background. Because if you in the first chapter remember, and you'll see that down in the exhibition in the other illustrations that are down there, the story repeatedly compares this little black boy to an ape. To When he sees himself in the mirror, he says, who's that little black monkey? And when he escapes through the forest um, from the house, he moves like a baby gorilla. So the degeneration is already acting within him. But the fantastical world and the illustrations can show us what moral behavior can reverse this. 
So education is absolutely crucial in this. And this is where Kingsley's satire is perhaps the sharpest, and which is only su surpassed by the sharpness of Sanborn's illustrations. Kingsley namely says that the wrong type of education could be even worse than none at all. And cramming lots of facts, such as multiplication table, into children's he heads would actually be harmful. We can to see Tom here sulking. He really doesn't look happy with maths. This could have been me in school. Um, um, but we, most strikingly, uh, at the other end of his journey, if you remember this, and there's some really fantastic illustrations downstairs, he meets the Tom Toddies. And the Tom Toddies are sort of the new Victorian school children who have been exposed to too much cramming. So this is a really forced education of cramming lots of facts into your brain. And they descend the evolutionary ladder even further than monkeys. They become vegetables, and they don't look very happy at all. Um, and so they, they get build up so much pressure in their head because one of the things Victorians believed is that if your mental capability deteriorates, your head gets watery. And they build up so much pressure through their education system that one of the turnips actually bursts um, because watery brains were the side effect of deteriorating mental function, which was caused by bad education. Um, and it's, uh, it, if you reread this, this sounds really contemporary. It's quite scary. <laughs> But wrong education did not only affect children. He has a grown-up version over there. Um, well, you can see this is quite a grown-up version. Um, um, but the grown-up equi equivalent of bad education was the adoration of what Kingsley calls the great fairy science, who is, unlike the other fairies, heavily sexualized. And this probably tells us, uh, the way she looks tells us a little bit more about Sanborn's fant fantasies than anyone else's. Um, but it gets the point across that people may be following her for the wrong reasons. And if you look more closely, she holds a magic wand which is labeled electricity. And this was a really typical punch and caricature thing, which Sanborn brings into children's book illustration. And so this fairy is not a real natural fairy. She's bewitching those who follow her. Um, but, but wait, wasn't Kingsley actually writing a pro-science story? Well, yeah, that's a good point, B, but he thinks that science must only ever be second to God, because as the creator, God knows all thing, things already, which science is only just discovering. And if this is what you're wondering all the time, is the meaning behind his other children's books, fairy names, Madam How and Lady Why. Madam How is the fairy science, and we must absolutely listen to her. But Madam Why is the fairy who knows why everything works and what the purpose of things is, which is something that science cannot expose. And if we ever were to see Madam How, she would make us feel smaller and meaner and more stupid and more ignorant than we had ever felt in our lives before. At the same time, it was make, would make us much wiser than any other time in our lives before. So logically, after passing through this theologically inflected education in the natural and social sciences, Tom becomes a good and a famous man of science, as he has learned from both Madam Howe, the scientist, and Lady Why, nature. And this brings me to my conclusion. So like all fairy tales, the water babies comes with a moral. And the moral begins with this sentence. Now, my dear little man, what should we learn from this parable? What should we, should, we should learn 37 or 39 things. I'm not exactly sure which. And this joke about the revision of the 39 Articles of Faith of the Anglican Church is a prime example of a joke that would probably go right over every child's head. And if we're honest, probably a significant proportion of today's adult readership too. <laughs> but does this mean that the water, baby is meaning, water babies is meaningless? if we don't get some of its jokes? Is it less of a children's story because children don't get every joke? Well, as you can see, I'm steering back to the question we set out to answer first. And the cop-out answer, of course, would be, is the water baby a children's story? Well, yes, it is, and no, it isn't. But I'm not quite going to leave you at this, because it's really crucial to acknowledge that um, when we are read stories as children, they inherently have two audiences, the adults, and the children. And as authors such as Kingsley or indeed Lewis Carroll were really, really aware of that, they carefully navigate this balance. Take, for instance, the ending of Alice in Wonderland. We often forget 
that the story does not actually end with Alice running off into the sunset after she's woken up from her dream. It ends with her older sister thinking about the dream of Wonderland. And as soon as she closes her eyes and starts thinking about Alice's dream, the thought alone of the real world becomes a little bit less bearable to her. Carol models for us the adult trying to think like a child after they've been exposed to the fairy tale. Now, do you remember what was on the first page of The Water Babies? Come read my riddle, each good little man. If you cannot read, no grown-up can. The change in perspective that children's literature facilitates through the child's perspective plunges us as the adult reader into Wonderland likewise, through which we can see our own environment as a land that makes us wonder and reevaluate anew what we consider unquestionable. So get back to the dusty old children's book and see what Wonderland awaits. Thank you.